on radio, online and mobile. You're with SBS Radio. This is SBS World News Radio. I'm Darren Mara. And I'm Mike Tomolaris. Coming up tonight... Le président. I want to be the president of all the French people, of patriots in the face of the nationalist threat. Les Français. What is at stake in this election is unbridled globalization, which is threatening our civilization. Political history in France after the first round of voting delivers no candidates from the major parties. Also this evening. Probably still uh, a bit traumatized about being separated from our parents. Some of the last survivors of Australian internment camps for Japanese civilians during the war speak out. And all the weekend action from the world of sport. Those stories and more in the next 30 minutes. Good evening with the news at 6 o'clock. I'm Mike Tomolaris. French president or presidential frontrunner Emmanuel Macron has emerged as the favourite to win the second round against nationalist right-winger Marine Le Pen in runoff elections on May the 7th. Mr Macron has won nearly 24% with Ms Le Pen on just over 21%. The 39-year-old former banker has promised to unite the country, saying he would govern for all people in France. I heard your desires for true alternation, for democratic will, for the ecological and economic demands to build a possible future that will make France stronger in a Europe that protects. I will need your vote. I will need your trust. Marine Le Pen told supporters the biggest challenge for France is what she called the threat of globalisation. French people have a very simple choice. Either we'll continue with the total deregulation without protection or borders with the consequence of, the out, of outsourcing, unfair competition, the free movement of terrorists reigns. The defeated centre-right and socialist candidates say they're now switching their allegiance to Mr Macron. New South Wales Veterans Affairs Minister David Elliott says it's the most sacred day on the Australian calendar. Um, Anzac Day has, of course, been going on uh, since the year after the, uh, the landing at Gallipoli, and this is the 101st Anzac Day commemoration. Uh, it is a very special day for Australians because we commemorate the death of 100,000 people who gave their lives to keep this nation safe. Police say that while there's no specific terror threat in Sydney, water-filled barriers and parked vehicles will be used to block key roads as a deterrent to any potential lone wolf attacks. The federal government has cancelled its plan to cut millions of dollars in funding for community legal centres across Australia after a backlash from the sector. Centres had been bracing for a 30% slash in funding from July the 1st. But Attorney General George Brandis now says $56 million in funding will be guaranteed for three years. This is new money. It's not being uh, removed or taken away or transferred from other priorities of the government. It is new money and it represents the large, largest single commitment on an annualised basis by the Commonwealth Government to the legal assistance sector ever. Katie Gallagher, acting opposition attorney general, says it's a humiliating backflip by Senator Brandis. The way this government has treated this sector has been unacceptable and it's been devastating. We know from our visits to community legal centres that the uncertainty that this cuts presented and the refusal of the government to provide any continuity of funding until today has meant that services and staff uh, have certainly left the sector, experienced staff, because they've had to go and find other jobs. Just back to Anzac Day now, and Australians across the country are preparing to commemorate those fallen in combat on uh, that sacred day. Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce will represent the government at the National Service in Canberra tomorrow. Governor-General Peter Cosgrove and opposition leader Bill Shorten will mark the 75th anniversary of the Papua New Guinea campaign at services at Bomana Cemetery and Kokoda. Security has also been tightened in Gallipoli in Turkey, where Foreign Minister Julie Bishop will attend the Anzac Day dawn service at Anzac Cove. 
In other parts of the world now, an Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, has accepted the resignation of the country's defence minister and army chief of staff after more than 140 government soldiers were killed in a Taliban attack on an army base last week. Dozens of others were injured in the five-hour attack near the provincial capital of Mazar-e Sharif. Chinese President Xi Jinping has called for all sides to exercise restraint over tensions over North Korea in a telephone call with U.S. President Donald Trump. There are indications it may be preparing to conduct its sixth nuclear test ahead of the founding anniversary of its military tomorrow. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has also spoken with President Trump, and he says he had an in-depth exchange of opinions. We completely agreed to strongly urge North Korea to exercise restraint as they continue to repeat dangerous, provocative actions. North Korea's nuclear and missile issues are a significant threat to the security, not only of the international community, but also Japan. And a quick look at uh, tomorrow's weather. Anzac Day in Perth, partly cloudy, 25 degrees. In Adelaide, a shower or two, 20. In Melbourne, rain tending to showers, a top of 19. Hobart, morning rain, 18 degrees. In Canberra, rain, 16. Wollongong and Sydney, rain developing, 22 to 25 degrees. In Brisbane, partly cloudy, 25. In Cairns, a possible morning shower, a top of 29 degrees. And finally in Darwin, a possible shower or storm, 33. And Darren, more on these stories coming up on SBS World News with uh, Janice Peterson at 6.30. Thanks so much, Mike. Across Australia, this is SBS World News Radio. It's seven past six. I'm Darren Mara. Well, French political history has been made after the first round of that country's presidential election. Political newcomer Emmanuel Macron and divisive nationalist leader Marine Le Pen have emerged as the top two candidates. Lydia Feng reports. For the first time in modern French history, a mainstream political candidate has not made it to the final round of the presidential race. Instead, the voters of France have chosen two outsiders to face off for presidency. Newcomer Emmanuel Macron and nationalist leader Marine Le Pen. Opinion polls consistently project the 39-year-old Mr Macron as the favourite to win the runoff. He is the youngest ever French presidential hopeful and has never run for election previously. Before a cheering crowd of supporters, Mr Macron has called on what he terms patriots to rally behind him against what he calls the threat of the nationalists. I want to be the president of all the French people, of patriots in the face of the nationalist threat, a president who protects, transforms and builds, a president who allows those who want to create, innovate, do business and work to do so more easily and more quickly. Mr Macron's rise has been swift. He set up his En Marche political movement just a year ago while working as the youngest minister of the economy in the nation's history. The former banker framed himself as a progressive who wanted the economy to become more business-friendly in a liberal society. It is a radically different economic vision to his rival, Marine Le Pen, the Eurosceptic and anti-immigration leader of the National Front Party. Speaking to supporters in northern France, Ms Le Pen has called herself the candidate for the people and promises to defend France against globalisation. The French people must seize this historic opportunity that has opened up to them because what is at stake in this election is unbridled globalization, which is threatening our civilization. The French people have a simple choice. Do we continue on the path of total deregulation, without borders and without protection? And as a consequence, see the relocation of jobs, unfair international competition, mass immigration and free movement of terrorists. Former Prime Minister François Fillon was knocked out of the race. Mr Fillon, whose campaign was rocked by corruption allegations, has now called on his supporters to back Mr Macron. I am doing this with a heavy heart, but abstention does not run in my genes, especially when an extremist party is getting close to power. The National Front, this party created by Jean-Marie Le Pen, has a history that is known for its violence and for its intolerance. Its social and economic program would lead our country to bankruptcy. And to this chaos, we would have to add the European chaos with the exit from the euro. 
I assure you, extremism can only bring unhappiness and division. There is no other choice but to vote against the far right. I will therefore vote in favour of Emmanuel Macron. Mr. Fillon was tied in third place with fast-rising Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Mr. Mélenchon was the leader of a grassroots movement called, in English, In Submissive France, which had the backing of the Communist Party. He refused to accept early projections that indicated his defeat and was not ready to back another candidate in the runoff. Car les défis que nous avons... The challenges that we've named without making light of any and all those difficulties to solve them, the challenges are still yet to be solved. And those who pretend today to have the honour to be representing us all have already demonstrated that they're incapable to even think about these. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker has congratulated Emmanuel Macron and wished him well for the runoff election. Germany has also welcomed Mr Macron's success in the first round. Political analysts say Mr Macron's biggest concern now is to transcend traditional party divides into a working majority. The head of the University of Sydney's School of Social and Political Science, Professor Simon Torme, says the June runoff will show whether Mr Macron can overcome them. His problem is going to be that because he doesn't have a party structure behind him, um, it's the next step which is going to be difficult. So if he's elected president, he's still got to basically earn a majority in the Assemblée Nationale. Normally, of course, that uh, a president comes in because they've been the, the, the top candidate from the Socialist Party or, the, or, or a right-wing party, and they've already got representation in the Assemblée Nationale. Professor Simon Tormey ending that report by Lydia Feng. Well, some 16,000 kilometres from France is the French overseas territory of New Caledonia, which is also taking part in the elections. An independence referendum due in 2018 was front of mind for many voters there. SBS correspondent Stefan Armbruster joins us now live from New Caledonia. Stefan, how are the election results panning out in the French Pacific territories? Well, Darren, they're so very, very different to back in France. Um, in New Caledonia, where I am at the moment, uh, Mr. Fillon, he received 31% of the votes. Marine uh, Le Pen received 29%, and Emmanuel Macron only 13% of the vote, whereas in French Polynesia, which is uh, quite a way away from here, another, another few thousand kilometres, uh, François Fillon received 35% of the vote, uh, Ms Le Pen 32%, and Macron only 14%. So that's, that's in stark contrast to what's happened in France. So what can we interpret from those results, Stefan? What do they mean for us? Well... What, what it's in terms of the overall outcome of the French election, it's very, very. We're talking very small numbers of people. We're talking about a quarter of a million people in each of these two French territories. But what is telling about it is that these these islands, these territories, they they're dominated by uh, basically expatriate French and other people, and there's an indigenous minority. And for the expatriates, the Republicans have always these have always been Republican strongholds. And the Republicans, to them, have represented stability, and it's meant basically they would stay part of France. Whereas the left and the socialists, they've all they've engaged with the uh, or flirted with the idea of decolonisation or a sort of uh, a loose loose alliance or a looser territorial structure. So that's that's where the, the political allegiances lie. Here, they've clearly stated, and we've seen with the Le Pen vote here in New Caledonia. She's uh, almost dub more than doubled her vote here. Um, basically, they, people are saying, we want to stay in France. And what are the ramifications for the slated independence referendum? Well, this, this is where it's going to be really interesting. Um, Ms Le Pen has, for the first time for this election, said she actually will respect the outcome of the independence referendum here in New Caledonia next year. So that's the first time that all the candidates who have been running for the presidency have said that. But ultimately, it comes down to who gets elected in the legislative and Senate elections, which are coming up in June and September, because it doesn't matter so much what the president says, it matters what the French parliament decides. And they'll decide, they'll decide how the vote is conducted. The vote has to be conducted here as part of the constitution under the Numir and Matignon Accords. But as we, as we know, with referendums in Australia, it's all in the wording. And the wording hasn't been nailed down yet. And there's also some questions about the electoral roll. So whoever manages to get the seats in the parliament, they'll be basically guiding this referendum through. OK, thank you very much there, Stefan. That was Stefan Armbruster, SBS correspondent, speaking to us from New Caledonia. 
This is SBS World News Radio with me, Darren Mara. It's 15 past six now. Still to come, all the action from the weekend in sport on SBS World News Radio. But first, the latest State of the States report is out, assessing the states and territories in eight key economic indicators. They include growth, retail spending, business investment, unemployment, construction, population growth, housing finance and dwelling commencements. It's quite a list. Matt Canellon spoke with Comsec Chief Economist Craig James, who says population growth has underpinned economic performance in New South Wales. So you look at New South Wales, it's number one in terms of dwelling starts for the number of homes uh, being uh, built and um, that's creating momentum across the, the broader economy. So basically ranks first, second or third out of um, all the, uh, the eight indicators that we look at. And so the ACT is now the top ranked on housing finance and second overall. Is that a surprise? It is a little bit of a surprise, um, but a small economy like the, the ACT, we can see substantial changes uh, from quarter to quarter. So the ACT now is only slightly in front of uh, Victoria, but um, uh, the ACT has improved on, on five out of the eight indicators where Victoria has actually slipped on, on two of the indicators. But really there isn't a lot to separate the ACT and Victorian economies. And so the Victorians close out the, the top tier of states, if you like. Why is there a gap between those top three and then the rest? Well, I think we can put it down to population growth. We, we know that New, New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT are leading the way in terms of population and growth across the nation. Uh, the demand for, for housing um, and the momentum that, that, that it provides. And so that leaves Tasmania, Queensland, the Northern Territory and, and Western Australia. What needs to happen uh, in order for them to close the gap to the, to the top three? Well, it is all different. You know, so if you look at Tasmania, very much driven by tourism and, and ex exports, particularly exports in the agricultural or consumer goods sense. Um, Queensland, Queensland seen growth in terms of exports and stronger growth in, in terms of housing activity, but um, it's yet to, to be replicated right the way across the state in terms of momentum. Um, Northern Territory is a, a mix of indicators. It's um, top ranked on three of the indicators, but um, it's bottom ranked on uh, a number of the, uh, the others, three of the other indicators. So it's very much a mixed economy. It's probably got more potential to weaken rather than strengthen. And in terms of South Australia, well, it tends to basically hold its relative position. And um, uh, it's unlikely to see, you know, sort of enough happen, you know, in South Australia over the, the short term to, to see changes in economic momentum. And according to the report, Western Australia has annual growth rates below the national average on all eight indicators. Uh, is there a particular explanation for that? Well, I think we could put that down to, to the ending of the mining construction boom. And, and I suppose what we've got to remember is that this is the biggest mining construction boom that we've seen probably in, you know, sort of 100 years. And they really lit a fire under the Western Australian economy from 2011 through to 2014. Uh, Western Australia was number one on um, our uh, State of the States report, you know, for that for 14 straight quarters. That was Comsec Chief Economist Craig James speaking with Matt Canellan. Real Inspiracion returns in April and May with the 20th Spanish Film Festival at Palace Cinemas. 39 new Spanish language films include the sexy box office hit Kiki, Love to Love, Best Picture Goya winner, The Fury of a Patient Man and The Queen of Spain starring Penelope Cruz, showing across Palace Cinemas nationally. Purchase tickets now at SpanishFilmFestival.com. SBS On Demand, the best movies, documentaries and dramas from around the world. World movie favourites with programmes in over 80 languages. All for free, anytime on SBS On Demand. Download the app on your tablet, phone or smart TV or go to sbs.com.au forward slash on demand and start watching. Watch the Premier League on SBS, the biggest names and teams in football, live, free and in HD. Face to face with Zabaleta, Rose with the cross, oh. and stretched it to his own goal by Carlos. Saturday nights on SBS. Start with a pinch of this, add a little bit of that, and you have all the ingredients for the perfect recipe. Check out Food Network, Australia's new food channel. Absolutely delicious. Serving up 24-7 food free on Channel 33. 
sbs.com.au slash news is your destination for Australian and international news. Listen to audio highlights, subscribe to our podcast and hear bulletins and programs on demand. There are photo galleries, special features, videos and updates throughout the day. It's all at sbs.com.au slash news. You're listening to SBS World News Radio with Darren Mara. Welcome back, SBS World News Radio. It's now 20 past six. Well, when war broke out with Japan 75 years ago, its impact on Japanese civilians living here in Australia was profound. Thousands of men, women and children were rounded up and detained in internment camps around the country. As Anzac Day approaches, some of the last survivors of those camps have shared their stories of one of the lesser-known dark legacies of the Second World War. Jani Balak Blakali reports. Tomoko Eileen Matsumoto remembers her father fondly. He was a beautiful man, very quiet, strong, very strict, especially with daughters. <laughs> he only had one. But the memories are tinged by a war that separated her family. She was just four years old and living in Darwin when, thousands of kilometres away, Japan bombed Pearl Harbour and Prime Minister John Curtin announced the war had come to Australia. Women of Australia, we are at war with Japan. Ms Matsumoto's father worked in the pearling industry and he was rounded up along with other Japanese civilians living in Australia at the time. His family initially went with him from Darwin to a civilian internment camp in Tatura, Victoria. Other camps had been set up around the country and already held Italian and German civilians. Altogether, 4,700 Italian civilians living in Australia, 4,000 Japanese and 2,000 Germans were detained. But for Miss Matsumoto, there was an extra cruel twist. Her mother was Aboriginal and she and her siblings were later separated from their parents and sent to a Christian mission in the Tiwi Islands with children of the stolen generations. Probably still uh, a bit traumatised about being separated from our parents. Yeah, it's just only, I suppose, uh, mainly I remember the picnic days, you know, when the older girls used to take us out picnicking. Joe Murakami, who now lives in Japan, was 14 years old when his family was also interned at Tatura. His father was a successful businessman and photographer in Darwin, but he died in the internment camp. Mr Murakami says he remembers their lives being thrown into chaos in 1942. Well, the war broke out and the uh, soldiers came trooping in. We didn't know what was going on. And they said we were to be taken to an internment uh, facility and get everything together in the few hours we have, two or three hours, and we had to abandon everything. At the camps, each detainee was given a number. Despite 75 years passing, Joe Murakami says he'll always remember his. Oh, yeah, 118102, that was my number. They gave us a sort of a plastic uh, medal that we wore around our neck, like, like the troops were wearing. There was no school. Everyone would congregate at the dining hall. Couldn't go outside the, uh, the barbed wire fences, but we, we could play outside the hut. Japanese-Australian historian Yuriko Nagata says the story of civilian internment during World War II is a very important one. This is the story of immigrant as well. So Australia is an immigrant country. So the history of internment during World War II should be written and it has to be known. After the war ended, Tomoko Eileen Matsumoto and her parents were reunited. We were reunited. In 1948, uh, don't ask me what time of the year it was. All I remember, the grass was being, uh, the uh, spear grass was so high, so it must have been sometime after the wet down there. For myself, you know, everything just seemed to be right. We were all back together again. Both the United States and Canada have apologised for the internment of Japanese civilians during the war. But Miss Matsumoto is not looking for an apology from Australia. She says she simply hopes history won't forget her father. He was just a worker. 
lived in Australia for so long and they still um, took them, you know. So in a way, I think that wasn't fair. Tomoko Eileen Matsumoto ending that report by Gianni Blakali. It's now 25 past six on XPS World News Radio. And up next, as always, it was a busy weekend in sport. Here's Sunula Wasti with the best of it, including the A-League, AFL and the NRL. Sometimes in sport and in life, victory or defeat is the matter of the slimmest of margins. And so it was for Brisbane Roar and the Western Sydney Wanderers in the first match of the A-League finals. The regulation 90 minutes saw the teams finish with one goal each. 30 minutes of extra time saw no further goals, and even the standard five penalties each in the subsequent penalty shootout couldn't break the tie. But in sudden death penalties, Brisbane's Tommy Orr made his penalty, and then Raw Reserve goalkeeper Jamie Young proved the unexpected hero, saving Junpei Kuzakami's penalty and making sure of victory. Raw coach John Aloisi credits Young, but also believes his side truly earned their victory. I was confident he was going to save at least one penalty because, you know, that, that's the character he's got, that um, he believes that he's going to win football games for you, and uh, and he did that. The luck uh, went our way because we were very good um, after that first half. Brisbane's prize for victory a match against Melbourne victory next weekend. Although that's made more difficult with the matter of an away Asian Champions League match for the Raw midweek. The winner of that match will play in the grand final against the winner of the Sydney versus Perth semi-final also next weekend. Perth earned the right to play the Premiers after beating Melbourne City 2-0. Diego Castro and Joel Chianese, the goal scorers. In the AFL, two teams emerged from five weeks of the competition without a loss. One is the Adelaide Crows, their latest triumph, a 67-point thrashing of Gold Coast. The other is Geelong, an old favourite at the apex of the sport in recent times. Their latest triumph, a 38-point win over St Kilda. Captain Joel Selwood led the way with 43 disposals. Scarily for future opponents, he's told Channel 7 his side only hit their stride towards the end of the match. We just probably played into their hands a little bit in the first half, tried to move the ball on a little bit quicker than uh, what we would have liked. And, you know, probably even the first part of that third quarter was a bit the same, but finally gone to the out and another good last 40 minutes by the boys. In rugby league, times have been tough recently for the West's Tigers. Star players Aaron Woods, James Tedesco and Mitchell Moses all look like they'll be playing elsewhere soon, giving new coach Ivan Cleary a big task in rebuilding the club. But this weekend, they rose to the occasion, ending Canterbury's three-match winning streak, beating them 18 points to 12. Club captain Woods, ironically, looks like he'll be leaving the Tigers for Canterbury next year, and was spotted having coffee with Canterbury player David Clemmer and others in the lead-up to this match. But after helping defeat his possible future employers, he's told Fox Sports the recent fuss won't distract him from his present job. It's it's just part of footy this day and age, you know. Uh, I got caught having a coffee with one of my best mates, but at the end of the day I'm there to play football and that's what I'll do week in, week out. West Tigers captain Aaron Woods ending that report from Snulawasti. News headlines and weather up next. SBS World News Radio covers national and international events and issues through a diverse range of voices and perspectives. Join the conversation on the issues and stories that affect you. Like SBS World News on Facebook and comment on our stories. Or you can follow us on Twitter at SBS News. SBS, 7 billion stories and counting. Well, before we go, a final check of the day's main stories. French presidential frontrunner Emmanuel Macron has emerged as a favourite to win against far-right candidate Marine Le Pen in a runoff election in France on May the 7th. Ms Le Pen says the biggest challenge for France is what she calls the threat of globalisation. And now we'll look at tomorrow's weather. Perth, partly cloudy and 25. Adelaide, shower or two and 20. Down to Wollongong, rain developing and 20. Sydney, also rain developing and 25. Brisbane, partly cloudy, 25. And Darwin, possible shower or a storm and 33. And uh, you can see more SBS World News tonight, 6.30 on SBS. Of course, I'm Darren Mara. Thanks very much for listening. 